Today I want to take a look at some very useful tips and tricks for Unity game development that you might not know about. A lot of people, especially beginners, have never heard of developer notes for Unity Docs or the Uninomicon, or what is a copy constructor in C Sharp. We're going to cover all those things and more today. We're not going to waste more time on the intro. Let's just get right into it. All right, today we're going to start with one of my favorite hidden productivity gems, and that is developer notes for the Unity documentation. This plugin lets us fill in the gaps whenever we find something that's missing from the Unity docs. And over the years, hundreds of developers just like you have contributed notes to the documentation. And while it's hard to say how many notes there actually are, I would say there's probably thousands of them. But you wouldn't know it unless you have the plugin for Chrome installed. Once you have the plugin installed, you can see all of the notes at the bottom of every page of the documentation, if there are any. And of course, it allows you to contribute your own notes as well. So if you're on any page in the Unity Docs, doesn't matter what version, you just scroll down to the bottom of the page. If any developers have made notes, they'll be here. And there's a form here you can submit with your own notes. You can use Markdown and get a preview of what you're about to submit as well. You can also upvote anybody's note if you find it particularly useful. I'll put a link to this Chrome plugin in the video description. Another excellent resource that you should make use of is the Uninomicon. Now, arguably, it hasn't been updated for a long time. However, many of the things that are documented within the pages of this website are still true and will explain some of the very strange behavior that you experience once in a while when working with Unity. For example, what's the real behavior of the awake method when it's contained in a class that also has a runtime initialize on load method? This site will tell you. I want to show you a new feature of Unity 6 that I think most people will find very helpful, but for whatever reason, it's only mentioned in one brief line in the new documentation. In Unity 6, we can now have default object references inside of property drawers. This feature was previously only available in editors. It lets us assign default assets such as UXML templates, textures, or scriptable objects directly in the property drawer without relying on manual asset loading. Let's have a look at what that means. If I create a new serializable class here, let's suppose I'm building some kind of reusable world space UI object. Now the property drawer can have its own default references. Maybe we reference an asset tree, maybe some object, or maybe a texture. You can also have private references that you could access through a public property. Then you could override the create property GUI method and do whatever logic you want to do to display your property. It might be hard at a glance to understand why this is an improvement. Let's go look at it in Unity. First, let's have a look at this in Unity 2023. If I select this in the project window, and we take a closer look at the inspector, you can see that none of those references were exposed, not even in debug mode. Now let's jump back to Unity 6. Now when I have that object selected in the project, you can see we have spots for making references to other assets in the project. For example, I can drag a custom UXML script in here, and we can make use of that in our property drawer. You could do exactly the same thing with any other project asset. So how can we use that in code? Well, normally, if you wanted to set a default value for something like, suppose, a UXML document, you would do something like this. You would load asset at path, and you would have a string path reference here, which, of course, is very brittle. But now, since we can set a reference to a default asset right from the project window, you don't need to use these string references anymore. So just for an example, we might want to get a hold of that tree asset property from the object. We could have an if condition just to see if it's been set yet or not. And if it doesn't have a value, we can take that default value and use that instead. Apply modified properties. If we want to show it in the inspector, we can just add property field to the root. And of course, back in Unity in the inspector, we can override the default value with a different UXML document if we want. Speaking of UI Toolkit, it was pointed out to me the week before last that Unity has now begun implementing some of the functionality for world space UI behind the scenes. Let's take a look at what's here so far. I've selected a panel settings asset in my project and I'm just going to switch the inspector into debug mode. Now you'll notice we have the option to change the render mode from screen space overlay into world space. There's also a new field exposed here for world space layer. If we come out of debug mode, you'll notice that the render mode setting and the world space layer setting persist, and we get a warning about this being experimental. You'll also notice that the field that was there so you could supply a render texture is now hidden. Now I have a game object here that has a UI document on it. If I grab our panel settings and drag it into here, 
Now we have some new settings here for world space dimensions. Size mode can be fixed or dynamic, and if it's a fixed size, you can set its exact dimensions. So for example, we might have prepared some kind of UI with UI Toolkit that we want to show above the player's head. I can drag one in here that just has a simple label as an example. Then maybe we give it a Y value of 3 so it's above the player, and we could change the width and height to scale it down to an appropriate size. Now you can start treating it just like any other game object. For example, you can start moving it around, you can rotate it, of course, but notice that you can't adjust the pivot point, and this is one of the features that's not been implemented yet. To work around that, you could make it a child of another game object. If you want more on UI Toolkit, a roadmap post was made about two weeks ago on Unity Discussions. Now, why don't we step away from Unity itself and dig into some C Sharp. I was writing some code last week and I realized there's a type of constructor that we've never actually talked about on the channel before. Let's suppose I have a class that represents a visual tree asset. Maybe I'm building some world space UI. In this class, I might have a constructor that takes in a visual tree asset. We could use Unity assertions to make sure that it's actually not null and then set our member tree asset to reference that asset. In reality, I'll probably want to store a lot more information than just this reference, but let's keep it simple. There might be a situation where you want to make a copy of this particular class, and that's where this special type of constructor comes in. A copy constructor takes in as a parameter a reference to an instance of itself. Then you can leverage constructor chaining and directly call the primary constructor. A simple trick that I think a lot of people don't know about. Another trick relates to compile time constants for non-primitives. Maybe I have a method here in my mono behavior to move this object to a different position. In the start method, I can call move object by passing in any vector I want. But what if I want move object to have a default value? Maybe I want it to default to the world origin. We can't, for example, come down into the method signature and say that position should equal some new vector. And since vector3 is not a primitive type, we can't use the const keyword either. Likewise, you can't use a static read only and you can't use vector3.0. What you can do, however, is use the default keyword. So a default vector3 or just default. Now this works great if your world origin actually is 000, but what if it wasn't? Well, one thing you could do is you could check to see if the value that came in was the default, and if it was, you just move it somewhere else. Of course, this could be problematic if you actually, on occasion, really did want to go to position 000, because that will never work in this scenario. Your other option is to use a literal that represents the absence of a reference, which is null. If we make vector3 a nullable type and set the default to be null, we can just do a null check and assign the value that we want. Okay, that's enough about compile time constants and default values. Let's go back to Unity for a minute. I want to quickly show a few handy tricks that would have made my life easier in a few scenarios. Notice in this scene here that I don't have an active camera because I'm just working on my UI. If you want to get rid of that annoying message in the middle of the screen that says no cameras rendering, you can disable it using the three dots menu on the game window. You can always turn it back on when you're finished. Now let's hop over to my other scene and take a look at a few shortcuts which are either totally unknown or often forgotten. If you're working with a model or an animation in preview mode, all you have to do to get a bigger view of this is right click the top bar of the panel. Then you can size this however you want and you can do whatever it is you need to do. And then you can just close the window and it'll go back to where it belongs. This is especially useful if you're working with animations. So for example, if I'm clipping through this character's animations and I want a bigger view, we can bring out the panel. I still get the controls here in the tab, and I can also see everything that's going on inside of the inspector. Another useful trick that's very easy to forget about is if you want to find all of the references to a particular component, for example, maybe this player mover component, you can right click and select find references in scene. If I switch to the scene panel, you'll notice that everything has been grayed out except for the game objects that reference that particular component. And up in the top left corner, you can see that we're doing a search for a particular reference. You can just clear out that search when you're finished. Another extremely useful thing that's very easy to forget about is that if you go into the edit menu, we have an undo history. This is particularly useful because you can jump back to any point in your history from this scene, all the way back to the scene being opened. Mine opened off screen, so I'm just going to drag it in here and dock it. So you can see I can jump all the way right back to the start if I want. Now this feature has been around since Unity 2022, but it wasn't very well publicized and I think myself included, lots of people forget that it even exists. 
Last tip for today, it can be useful to be able to inspect more than one object at a time. If you lock the inspector and you want to see another object's properties, just select that game object and press Alt P. This will give you a new tab that you can dock anywhere you want. And that way you can easily work with two different game objects at the same time. And don't forget that if you're using our Unity Utilities package, it does have a shortcut for locking the inspector, which by default is set to Control L. This also toggles constrained proportions on the scale property of the transform. And this is where we'll wrap it up for today. Hit the like button if you learned something new today. One quick announcement, we're doing an asset giveaway this week on Discord, so if you're not on Discord yet, there's an invite link in the description. Consider subscribing to the channel if you find this kind of content useful. We cover advanced and intermediate Unity and C-sharp on this channel every Sunday. I'll throw another video up on the screen if you're interested in watching more. Maybe I'll see you there.